How what's his name? Okay, we'll do that. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, it is with a great joy that we're able to come together tonight. We're looking so much forward into your word as we move forward in the Bible study of the book of Revelation. And Lord God, we're so grateful to know you as our Father and knowing that uh, our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life and that uh, you are doing a great work right here in our midst. And I just pray, Lord God, that as your word goes forth, that you would accomplish what you desired to do and that it would... Uh, have an impact upon our lives, that it would draw us closer to you, that would give us a deeper rooted, solid foundation of conviction, and that we would live by it each and every day, and that uh, through that you would empower us and equip us uh, to do the things that you would have us to do as a church family. Lord, I pray for those that were um, here this morning, that heard the word, I pray to God that that word would hold on into their minds and their hearts, that it would do a work that would uh, bring about your glory and honor. And Lord, as we continue to build upon that over the next two Sundays, may it be something that you would be able to use right here at Tar Heel Baptist Church uh, to help us to be more of what you would have us to be. Uh, so Lord God, tonight as we come before you, uh, you are the Lord God Almighty. You have all power and authority. You have all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So as we pray on behalf of these that are on our prayer list, as well as the many other requests that would be heavy upon our hearts, we come to you because we know that you are able. We know, Lord God, that there is nothing that is impossible for you. So we bring these petitions and desires, we place them at the foot of the cross. We pray, Lord God, that your will be done in and through their lives, and that you would do a work. For those that are sick and suffering, we do pray for your healing touch. We, we thank you, Lord, and how that we have seen so many times how that you've heard our prayers and how that you've brought healing in other people's lives. And we pray that you will continue to do that. We'll continue to offer our praise for you. We also pray, Lord God, tonight for those who are grieving and heavy of heart and those who have lost loved ones. We know, Lord God, that the sorrow can linger on for some time. But we pray that you'd come alongside them and that you'd bring them and deliver them from that depth of sorrow that would hinder them or stop them from being and doing what you would have them to do. We also pray, Lord God, especially for those who are lost and undone without Christ. We pray, Father God, that you'd bring conviction upon their heart. We pray that they would see the light and understand that they are to fear their eternal state without Jesus Christ, and that they would understand that the wages of sin is eternal separation and death and the everlasting burning hell. We pray, Father God, that they would uh, repent of their sin, trust Jesus before it's everlasting too late, and be saved. We pray, Father God, for our church family here. We pray that you would empower us, that you would strengthen us, that you would uh, equip us by the working of your Holy Spirit as we learn more and more of how to yield our life to you so that you can do a work in and through us. Bless us tonight. Bless us in the Word. Bless me, O oh God, as I stand before your people. Give me wisdom and understanding. Help me, Lord God, to preach. And I'll give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And for his name's sake, we humbly pray. Amen. All right, tonight, uh, if I remember correctly... Uh, as we are in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. Uh, if I remember, I think I'm right, we left off with the ninth verse of the uh, seventh chapter. Am I correct? Anybody have that? You have it? I have a thumbs up there. So uh, that's good because that's where I started studying for tonight, <laughs> where I needed to pick up. Okay, so, so tonight as we look at this, I want us to, to take into consideration... The things that we're, of where we are. I know it's been, it feels like it's been forever since we've been uh, here on Sunday night in the book of Revelation. So let's kind of let's do a very quick overview, if you will. We know that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ 
that was given to his servant John, who was on the island of Patmos. He was exiled there because of his faith, because of his testimony in Jesus Christ. And as he was there, instead of whining, he was worshiping the Lord on the Lord's day. And the Lord came to him and revealed to himself to him. Now the revelation that he saw had a lot to do with the message that needed to go out to seven churches in Asia. And as, so as these letters were given to John, he wrote them down. He sent them to the pastors of the seven churches. And as he wrote, the, as he sent those letters, he gave this statement in each one of them. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. So all of the churches were to interchange the letters of what they had received uh, with other churches, and it is preserved for us. And when we hear the Word of God, the same things uh, that were um, uh, made of correction or even promotion, whatever it was, to the churches, this was also meant for us. And we take great pleasure in understanding that and knowing that uh, that God is equipping us even through uh, these things that have been given to us. Now, the book of Revelation was given to the church as a message of encouragement. They were under a lot of persecution. They were under a lot of, of um, uh, great suffering. And so Jesus wanted them to know that he is still on the throne and that there is victory in his precious name, that in the end we win. Folks, we live in a terrible world. We live in a sin-cursed world. We live in a world where there's so much darkness and evil seems to prevail. But we need to also know that there is a God in heaven who is in charge and that he's watching over all things. And so we are under his care. We come under his uh, power and authority as we enter into that relationship through Jesus Christ. And so that gives us great joy. So after the seven letters were written, we see where John was also, as he looked up into heaven, he saw an open door and there was a voice that came to him and says, come up here. And immediately he was in the spirit and he was taken up into the realms of glory. Now, as we read and study in the book of Revelation, these are things that are yet to come. So John, as he looked, he saw a throne. He saw the one that sat on the throne. He saw the four beasts that were flying around the throne, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There was thundering and lightnings that were proceeding out of the throne. There were 24 elders that were around the throne who also joined in to the worship. And then there was an angel that had come and had shouted out for all of the universe, all of creation to hear who is worthy to receive the book of the, and the, open the seals thereof. So the one who sat on the throne, he held the, the, the book up and there was a search all over heaven, all over earth and all under the earth and no one was found. John began to weep. One of the elders came to him and said, John, don't cry, don't weep. Because there is one worthy, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he said it was the Lamb that was slain. And so as John looked again toward the throne, there was uh, Jesus as the Lamb that was slain. And uh, he was the only one that was found to be worthy. And he reached and received the book, all the four angels. Now, the Bible tells us, I want us to, I want us to take a careful attention to this, because you see, before... Uh, the, Jesus receives the, the book with the seven seals on it. The angels are flying around the throne crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When Jesus receives the book, we find these four beasts on their face before Jesus worshiping and praising him because he was worthy to receive glory and honor and all of these things and all of the all of the elders again joined into the chorus of worship and praise so after Jesus we saw the seven the, the seals being opened up we saw the four horsemen with the four first four seals and then the fifth seal was where we saw the saints um, uh, under the altar and they were crying out, Lord, how long will it be before you avenge our blood? And then as the sixth seal uh, was opened up, we began to see uh, all of these things that were uh, happening, how that the mountains 
uh, uh, and the earth did quake, and, and uh, there was so much devastation was going on. Uh, people tried to hide because in verse 17 of chapter 6, it says, For the day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? As we opened up into the seventh chapter, we saw where there were the sealing of the hundred and forty-four thousand Jews, twelve thousand from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. And so all of these were given, and it brings us down to verse 9. He says in verse 9, he says, After this, after the sealing of the hundred and forty-four thousand, after this, he says in verse 9, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. Now, one of the things that has been a misconception of reality of the book of Revelation is that um, once the rapture of the church has taken place, that there be no chance for salvation in the tribulation period. Well, that's not true. Um, one of the things that we do realize that in the book of First Thessalonians, we find where uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, and he does tell us that those who have rejected the truth will receive the great deception and believe the lie. Now, I would believe that that would mean for those who have, have been uh, taught, those who have uh, been under the sound of the gospel, those who have been even convicted of heart and yet resisted the light, resisted the glorious truth of salvation. I believe that these individuals will not have a chance during the time of tribulation. But even still, we find that there will be many people in the tribulation that will be saved. This right here is a proof of that. He says, he says there is a, he saw a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people and tongues that stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, folks, one of the things that has been given to the church for over 2,000 years, we have been charged with the great commission to go into all nations, baptizing them, teaching them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And out of the 2,000 years that that commission has rested upon the shoulders of the church, we have failed to do that. We have failed to reach the nations for the Lord Jesus Christ. But during the tribulation period, the 144,000 that is sealed with the seal of God on their forehead, they are going to be able to reach the unreached. They're going to go to every nation, to every tongue. And that's what we find here. Every nation, every tongue of every tribe. There's not going to be a soul that will not have heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there will be many. Here it says that no man could number them, and they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. So there might be someone that will be sitting on the sideline who will be saying in their own hearts, well, if I miss it this time, I might be able to make it next time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no promises of a tomorrow, and you don't know how in the world you're going to come to the end of your days here. So I would strongly encourage anyone who is not, not ever saved, who has never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that out of the urgency of the day, out of the urgency of the time in which we now live, you need to humble yourself before a holy God, repent of your sin, and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior before it's everlasting too late. We don't ever know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes. But yet still, there is an opportunity. As the door remains open, as you have opportunities to be able to call on the name of Jesus, there is time for you to be saved. But you need to know and you need to understand that in all reality, we can't pick or choose the time that God comes knocking on our door. You see, the Bible tells us in John's Gospel, chapter 6. Listen to this ever so closely. Because in John's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus tells the people, 
He says, there is no one that can come to me except my Father draw him. That means it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit to bring people to the point of understanding their guilt and their shame before a holy God and that they would repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of their soul and experience conversion, experience the salvation of being born again. That's only the work of God. You see, salvation is all about God. He comes in, he brings conviction, he brings light and understanding, and he gives us the opportunity to say yes or say no. And that's what we have. We need to hear that. We need to understand that. And if you were to resist the truth now, if you were to reject Jesus Christ right now, because you see, folks, listen, I've heard it, and I've understand it, and I believe it, that every time the conviction of the Spirit comes upon our life, and we resist it today, and then we come back next Sunday, and then we resist it again, and we resist it again, and we resist it again, there's going to come a time, although the Spirit continues to knock Although the Spirit continues to reach and to call people to salvation in Jesus Christ, when we resist and resist and resist, our heart becomes calloused and hard to where we do not even hear the sound of the gospel anymore. Folks, listen, I believe the church many times are filled with people whose hearts are so hard they can't be touched with the singing of the music. They can't be changed by the preaching of the word. And it's all because they've said no, no, no. No, and they've said no too many times. They can go through the motions, but nothing is real. Folks, listen. There's a reality of a life in Christ. A reality that Jesus lives within my heart. You see, in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it says that it is the Spirit that witnesses with our spirit. That we are the children of God. It's only the true worshipers, the true born again people that can experience the fellowship of worship in the spirit. And so therefore we find this. So there will be people that will be saved during the tribulation period. And listen to where they are. Listen, he says, he says there will be people which cannot be numbered of all nations and kindreds of people and tongues that stood before the throne and before the Lamb. You see, these people are there in the very presence before a holy God. They are there before the Lamb and before the throne. And look here in the passage of Scripture. He says in verse 9, he says, clothed with white robes. Now, the being clothed with white robes means that they have been cleansed, that they have been justified, that they have been sanctified by the work of God, and they are allowed the special privilege of being in the very presence of the Lamb and of the throne of God. So you can just imagine. Now also we find here in verse 9 that he says that they have palms in their hand. Now we also want to, this would take us back to the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was uh, going into Jerusalem riding on a donkey's colt. And as he was there, the people, they strode their clothes out in front of him. They had palm branches that they strode out in front of him. And they were worshiping him, saying, Hosanna in the high, uh, glory to God, Hosanna in the highest. Um, and uh, the one who has come uh, to redeem us. All of these things that are taking place. And these people who have been uh, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, those who have been clothed in the white garments, and they're there in the very presence of Jesus and the throne, and they have... Uh, these palm branches, the palm branches meant was a sign of victory. The palm branches was a sign of celebration. It was something that the people were doing in celebration and worship before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Verse 10, he says, and they cried. This whole, you can imagine, well, multitude of people where no man could number. Listen, he says, and they cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. They were giving all the glory and the praise to the Lamb and to the one who sat on the throne. 
Oh, folks, listen, salvation is of God. It begins with God and it ends with God. And it is kept by the power of God. And we ought to be able to collectively worship in that glorious joy of our salvation. I believe that we have taken our salvation too lightly. I think that we miss out on the true worship of the gratitude of heart that we owe unto our King of kings and Lord of lords. Because I believe that if we were able to come together and worship in the means and the manner of what we should be able to, there would be a greater gratitude and a greater ability of service and loyalty within the body to be able to do the things that are called upon us to do. We would be obedient people. We would be joyful people. We'd be successful people. We'd be victorious people. And we would be people of power. Now, folks, listen, it's not our power. I want you to understand that. Folks, anytime the church is empowered, it comes from heaven above. It's not something we possess. It's where God is able to possess us and use us to accomplish the things. That, this is what I was preaching about this morning. And we need to know that. We need to experience that. And it's available. It's right there for us. All we need to do is humble ourselves before God and claim it. As we would yield our hearts and our life unto Him. Oh, there's so much. So much that I see. So much that I know in my heart that I believe God wants to do with our lives. But yet somehow, some way or another, we are not able to grasp a hold to it. I pray that we will. I pray that we will be able to do that so that we could truly be able to experience. Because I believe the time is short, the day is at hand, that Jesus is coming soon. So they were praising the Lord cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation unto our God. And the one, that, or, uh, Salvation to God, which sitteth on the throne and to the Lamb. And then in verse 11, I'm going to do this very quickly and I'm going to quit. We'll get through verse 11. He says, And all the angels stood around about the throne, and about the elders, and about the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Now, I want, you, I want you to take notice here of what happens. Because in the fifth chapter, the fourth and the fifth chapter, we find that worship begins there at the throne with the four beasts. Okay? The four beasts, they're crying out all day, all day, 24 hours a day. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And as they would call out and proclaim God's holiness, the 20 el 24 elders would join in. They would, they would be joining in with the four beasts. We come to the fifth chapter when Jesus receives the book to open the seals thereof. We find the four beasts again who begins in the worship, they, they bow before Jesus Christ, and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy are you. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor, because you are worthy to receive the book and open the seals thereof. And when they cry out, the 24 elders join in. But I want you to see here in this passage of Scripture, where we just read, who starts off the praise. Who starts off the worship? It is the ones who are clothed in white. <laughs> Listen, we think that we're going to get in there and join with the angels in the celebration music. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe, I believe that very possibly it could be the righteous whose clothes are, who are wearing the robes of white, who are celebrating their own salvation through the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne. It may be very well that we, the redeemed, begin the celebration of the worship of the holiness of God and His, and His great mercy and uh, grace. And then listen what happens. The four beasts 
They fall down. As the, as the people proclaim God's goodness and mercy and salvation, they fall down. And the angel and the 24 fall down. And then, listen, the angels join in. We start it off. Folks, listen, we need to get up in gear. We need to wake up. We need to understand that when we come together at church as a body of believers, we need to ramp it up a bit. Because, you see, if we're going to outdo the angels, if we're going to outdo the beast because of the very redemption of the precious blood of Jesus that has been shed upon us, folks, we have to get it right. And that day's coming. That day's coming. Boy, that'll get your heart pumping. What a glory. What a glory. Hey, praise the Lord. My feet want to move now. Amen. Amen. We're going to stop right there. We're going to hold it up right there. We're going to pick up verse 12. Lord willing and the church don't rise. Next time we come together. Okay. Verse 12. Okay. Whew. Somebody pray for us. Somebody dismiss us in prayer so we can go back there and have fellowship and have some sweets and enjoy the time together. And also to be rejoicing in our salvation, folks. We got a lot to be thankful for. We got a lot to be thankful for. Somebody close us. I don't care who it is.